This week's film review is for the film Breakthrough, which was produced by Devin Franklin and directed by Roxanne Dawson. When Joyce Smith's son, John, falls through an icy lake, all hope seems lost. But as John lies lifeless, Joyce refuses to give up, and her steadfast belief inspires those around her to pray for his recovery. Based on the incredible true story of one mother's unwavering devotion, Breakthrough is an enthralling reminder that faith and love can create a mountain of hope, and sometimes even a miracle. As this film is a testimony, I have structured the review questions a little differently. So the first review question I have is, did I reflect on the Ten Commandments during the film? And if I think about the first commandment, promoting God, there were several scenes with worship service. There was a scene showing a woman praying to God as the fire engine drives past her house with its lights on. We see Joyce praying over her son, praying for the Lord to bring him back to life. And this reminds me of John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. We also see a scene with Joyce, where she tells the neurologist to do his best and let God do the rest. And we see John's class praying for him, and this includes a student who he doesn't get along with. We also see John's mother, Joyce, and her unwavering belief that God could and would heal her son when everybody else thought that she was just in denial. We see the firefighter's reflection on how John was saved. The firefighter was not a believer, and yet he could not come to any other conclusion on how John was saved. There must be a God. We see the neurologist's statement to Joyce that John was a miracle. And I, and I remember the scene where he hugged Joyce for a long, long time. I thought that was just so powerful. A man who did not believe, and yet in this scene, he, at least to me, was showing that he was just humbled at this miracle. He was in awe. And then we have the scene with Joyce's statement when they were witnessing during the worship service about John's full recovery. And she said, God's love is the only thing that makes all things possible. And that reminds me of Matthew 19 26 that says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. In terms of the commandment about idols, when I was watching the film, I was reminded, or I thought, about that Joyce was put in her pride before the Lord, thinking that she could control her life. And uh, the Bible says that anything we put before the Lord is an idol. And uh, Joyce realized this, and she repented for this, and fully submitted to the Lord. And then we have the commandment about not using his name in vain. There was a scene where, you know, this was a Christian school that John went to. And there was a scene where he takes the Lord's name in vain when his mother delays driving off after dropping him off at school. But this was not used as entertainment. And I don't know if this actually happened because, you know, this film is based on a true story. But you did get the impression that it was very close to the original testimony, because at the end of the film, they give you some comparisons with the real family that this happened to, and there are scenes with the real family. So I um, I got the impression that the film was very closely based on the real life, real life events. And so we see this scene where, you know, John takes the, the Lord's name in vain. I see that as it wasn't done as entertainment. It was done. I I saw it as a reflection of where John was spiritually, um, even though he was attending a Christian school. And I have heard Christians take the Lord's name in vain, maybe not even realizing that they're doing it, or it's a habit from before that they haven't quite kicked yet. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell why uh, why it happens. But anyway, I just noticed that and uh, it made me think about that commandment. And um, in terms of the Sabbath, there, there was a worship service shown. There were several shown, and one of them was specifically shown on Sunday, but Sunday was not promoted as the correct worship day. In terms of the commandment to honor parents, 
John called his father by his name instead of dad, and he didn't hug Joyce goodbye before leaving for a sleepover at his friend's house. The scene showed Joyce being upset, as she considered what he did as disrespectful, but Brian, her husband, wanted to show John grace because he was going through this new rebellious phase of his life. He was entering into teenage years and he was thinking a lot about the fact that he was adopted and he was kind of pushing back at them for that. So Brian wanted to give him grace through this, whereas uh, Joyce was a bit, um, just a bit taken back, I think, by, by how her son seemed to be changing rapidly. In terms of the commandment against a uh, lion, there were scenes where the pastor speaks against lion in the worship service. And there were scenes where John uh, lies to his mother and his coach and his teacher during this very difficult phase of his life. And um, it was depicted in the correct light that he was struggling with things and he was struggling with himself. It was not seen or used as some type of uh, entertainment like some films do. And then we have, uh, I thought about the commandment against jealousy. There was a scene where John showed some feelings of jealousy towards a classmate of his, or actually his classmates in general, because as far as I understood from the film, he was the only one in the class that was adopted. And we are shown how jealousy was a destructive force in his life. It made him angry, overly competitive, disrespectful, and distant to loved ones, friends, and even potential friends. And so I also reflected on what Christian standards did I think about when I was watching the film. I thought about scripture alone. During a worship service, the pastor opens his Bible to start preaching from the Gospel of Luke and asks the congregation to follow in their Bibles. And there is a scene showing Joyce reading scripture while waiting for a phone call from John, and it shows her reading her Bible at the kitchen table. There was a scene where the pastor tells his children about a pastor being considered a shepherd and the congregation being his sheep. And that is taken from scripture. The film made me think of salvation through Christ alone. The pastor gives an analogy based on a popular TV series and God's gift to us, Jesus. People may have different takes on how the analogy was done. It didn't do anything for me as I don't watch the series that he mentioned, but the analogy nevertheless pointed to and was intended to point people to follow Jesus Christ for life. And then we have the Christian standard of the state of the dead. There was no mention of John going to heaven or his mother's expectations that he did as he was laying before her lifeless. There was also no mention from John of having been in heaven when he came back to life. So John's death was dealt with in a way that was in tune with scripture. In terms of biblical marriage, Joyce and her husband were on different pages when it came to faith. They were both believers but approached the tragedy differently as Joyce relied solely on her faith and her husband relied on human reasoning. However, the Lord brought them together and they both ended up putting the trust in the Lord hand in hand. In terms of the husband as the head of his home, in the beginning, Joyce's husband was not the spiritual leader of his house. But there is a scene where they are about to eat breakfast and her husband, whose name is Brian, does not bless the food. And Joyce reminds him and John that they are to join hands in prayer and, and bless the food. And then we have a scene at the hospital where Brian tells Joyce that he couldn't see John in his current state and couldn't go into John's hospital room, but he would be down the hall if his wife needed anything because he had no plans to leave the hospital. He just couldn't be in his son's room. Brian's faith wavered and he said himself he expected John to die, like everyone else did except John's mother Joyce. Brian later repents to his wife for not being by her side and John's bedside from the start. We see Brian's journey in faith throughout the film his faith wavering when his world was falling apart, and then we see his faith renewed. There is a scene where Brian, Joyce, and their pastor join hands beside John's hospital bed and, um, and pray for God's will to be done. And I think that's a powerful scene because as human beings, we either don't understand sometimes or we don't want God's will to be done. 
because we're afraid of losing what we love or we're afraid of what that will look like. It's a powerful prayer to pray when we just totally submit ourselves to God and say, however this turns out, it's okay because I know it's your will for whatever reason. And I may not understand why it turned out this way, but I've prayed about it and you could have stopped it, but you didn't. And so I respect your will and I still love you as my father. And that's just for me, um, just so powerful and uh, something that uh, is just a lifetime lesson that we have to do this over and over again. And it, it doesn't necessarily become easier, but doing God's will gives us peace when we totally submit to him. And I'm saying that because the word of God says that. In Philippians 4, starting from verse 5, it says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And that was Philippians 4. Verses 5 through 7. I also thought about the recognition of the value of life and blessing in children. Joyce's statement to her son was quite powerful when he was doing his homework. She said to him that he had a purpose and that he was loved. And this was a very difficult um, period of his life. And so although he didn't turn around and looked at her, you saw the expression on his face and that what she had said is registered, but he didn't give her a reaction. We also had Joyce's statement to her son at his hospital bedside, where she told him that he was her pride and joy. And then we also have Joyce's confession of regret concerning a decision she had made earlier on in her life concerning the adoption of her first child. I was also reminded of the recognition of the body as the temple of God. Joyce realized at some point that she was running her body into the ground in order to try and be there for John. 100%. She found relief in letting go and trust in the Lord, no matter what the outcome. And that was another powerful scene. I mean, this whole film was just, it was a very powerful witness. Throughout the film, we see glory and honor and thanks being given to God. At the breakfast table one day, Joyce reminded her family, as I said earlier, to bless the food. We see that the pastor gives glory to God for sacrificing his most dear possession, his son. We also see the scene where Joyce told the world-renowned neurologist to do his best and let God do the rest, after the doctor gave them little hope of John recovering. And then there was a scene with the very first doctor, who was the doctor on the scene when John had initially been taken into hospital. We see his reflection on how John came back to life, and His wife said it was a miracle, and he confirmed that he had no explanation for how John came back to life, and this doctor was just speechless. And then you see later on the doctor writing a note to his class on the day's events, telling them that he wanted everyone to remember the unexplainable series of events that brought John back to life. And he wrote that no matter what happens, he wanted to remember what some called He said what some might call a miracle. And I also remember the scene where the reporter included in her live news report that John had no pulse for an hour. His mother prayed, then he got a pulse. I also remember a scene where Joyce repented of a moment of weakness when she gives herself honor for saving John's life. And she prays to the Lord for forgiveness for her pride. And just honors him in that moment and just submits to him and has this very intimate conversation with the Lord. And then we also see the scene where John thanks the Lord for bringing him back to life. So there was plenty of glory given to God and honor and thanks throughout the film. Did the film encourage my faith? How could it not? (laughs) It was a very powerful film mainly because it was based on a true story. It's, it's a testimony. And uh, it's a testimony how blessed we are when we have a growing relationship with the Lord, when we truly believe he is all his word says he is, that he is our rock, tower of strength, our, 
our creator, our father, comforter, healer, redeemer, savior, and so much more. In terms of what I did after seeing the film, well, I'm married with children, so it certainly caused me to reflect on my trust in the Lord and the welfare of my family. And it also reminded me of verses from the Bible that spoke to me during different scenes in the film. So I very much connected the film with scripture, as as I normally do, but um, I, I found myself maybe doing this more so in this film because it was essentially a testimony. I have a question here. Were there any scenes that caught my attention in regards to doctrine? As I mentioned, Breakthrough is based on a true story. I don't know which additions, if any, were put in that were not part of the, of the actual story. So that, that's why I'm phrasing my questions a little differently here, because we're not dealing with fiction. I know that in some true stories, they do add things but again, I, I don't know. Anyway, here are a few points that I made. A note about scripture songs versus regular songs used for worship. There is a scene in the church where you have a very modern um, band playing a worship song. And that seems to be quite common in the modern church. And there are debates about it. Sometimes it is difficult to hear the difference between worldly music and some modern worship music. In the last couple of months, I've actually found myself listening primarily to worship songs that are taken directly from scripture verses. And I'm thinking of Colossians 3.16 that says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you, richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. This verse from Colossians starts off with, let the word of Christ dwell in you. And I think, well, where do we get the word of Christ from? We get it from the Bible. So now I actively lean towards spiritual songs taken directly from scripture as we are then singing God's word right back to him. There is more power in those scripture songs than there could ever be in songs with lyrics made up by man. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. And Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divided asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when it comes to worship songs, scripture is the best way to go. Jesus used it in the wilderness and Ephesians calls it the sword of the spirit. Another thing that came to mind is it's basically from the same scene where there's clapping after a performance. And um, for me, clapping after a performance sounds more like a worldly concert than worship. I even heard a whistle amongst the congregation after this band uh, performed the song. And I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 10.31 that says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And when I reflect on this verse, saying amen after someone sings, plays an instrument, reads, etc., it seems more appropriate to me as that is directed to the Lord, so he is honoured and not man. And then there is the pastor's comment about it being a sin to lie, but even more so in the church service. And I just thought that wasn't biblical. Uh, a lie is a lie wherever you are, according to the according to scripture. The commandment does not say thou shall not bear false witness, especially during worship service. Um, it just says thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I know the pastor probably meant it as a kind of a joke, but we are talking about a holy law. So those kind of jokes make me feel very uneasy. Jesus didn't do this and he is our role model. In fact, I don't ever remember reading in scripture about Jesus making jokes. He was described as a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. Maybe he did, and it just wasn't included in, in the accounts, or maybe he didn't. Um, my only point is, is I get very uneasy when jokes and the commandments are in the same sentence. 
And then I noticed uh, the pastor's analogy of the TV series, the Bachelor series, which, as I said before, I haven't, I haven't seen. I get the context of being able to relate to different people. Um, I just think for me, there is a balance between being able to relate to people and not immersing yourself in the world in order to do it. A scripture says that we are in the world, but not part of the world. And that's in John 15, 19. And it's also in John 17, 16 and Romans 12, 2. It's a balance that um, has to be found in the prayer. And the pastor ended up saying, you know, that um, we should be submitting ourselves to Jesus for a lifetime. In summary, breakthrough is a powerful testimony. I have actually only seen it a couple of times because I find it so intense. And while I don't watch any Christian film for pure entertainment, there is a big difference between watching a film that you know has a fictional script and watching a film directly based on someone's testimony. It was a blessing to see it again and be reminded how blessed we are to have God the Father, his son Jesus, and the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder of the divine power and majesty of God the Father that leaves us speechless and humbled in the small context we experience it. It's a reminder that no matter how much we think we know, we have so much to learn, which makes me look forward to Jesus' return and the new Jerusalem. I watched the film on iTunes. I want to thank you very much for listening to this review. Until next time, peace be with you.